So China is against the U.S. and the U.S. is against the U.S. And well, it's kind of like, how can we possibly sit it? Of like, a house divided against it stand, itself cannot stand. That's right. That's that right. was Jesus quoting Abraham Lincoln. Or was it? Anyway. I think they both said it. <laughs> a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so, I mean, it is pretty bad when... Uh, yeah, we're just so against ourselves, and China is against us as well. Guys, I'm a wilderness kind of guy. I'm out here in the wilderness, and I'm loving it. But guess what? The wilderness can rip your face off and literally kill you if you don't have the right gear. That's why I use sportsmansguide.com for all my outdoor accessories, hunting accessories, fire starters, you name it. They got ammo, they got guns. Sportsmansguide.com, use code WARPOET. If you want to exist out here in the wilderness like me, you might just have to eat what you catch. <laughs> That's really bad. All right, hey folks, wanted to introduce you to a new friend. He was the Director of Intelligence Programs under the Trump Administration for the National Security Council. He's also a former Navy SEAL, so brother in arms. And so what we're gonna do is lean on his expertise to really understand some of the greater threats of China, some stuff going on from somebody who truly does know, and we also wanna talk about the border. And currently he is running for U.S. Senate in the state of Georgia to challenge Raphael Warnock. So really, really want uh, to be able to get behind him. But aside from that he's got amazing story about where he trekked across Afghanistan just as a civilian apart from military which is absolutely insane story so we're gonna learn a lot we're gonna have some fun but without further ado I want you to meet Latham Sadler thanks yeah, man appreciate you having me yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. For sure so um, as a general rule I don't like or trust politicians so like yesterday we were like, right. would have been cool, but right. today, Where are we today, you kind of moved into a different camp. Yeah. I don't know if I can trust you anymore. How do I know that you did security anything? Yeah. How do I know <laughs> that you can run a gun? How do I know that you can even shoot? You know how this goes. Pick up the phone and call my teammate. No, no, I don't know. I'm going to do better than that. I'm like, let's, let's leave here. Before we go any farther, I say we hit the range and we run and gun and have a little bit of fun, and then we can talk border in China. Oh, you can count me in on do that. Do you want to do uh, that? Let's get behind Because I would rather do the gun stuff. All right, so now that I know you can run a gun, you are who you say you are, you're a pretty cool dude, even if you're a SEAL. There uh, it goes. There, there it goes. I couldn't, I can't not. <laughs> I know. I can't not I try, I hey. tried to hey. Uh So what is the greatest threat to the U.S.? The greatest threat to the United States is China. I mean, hands down. And, you know, interestingly, you mentioned I was director for intelligence programs in the Trump administration on the NSC. That was a global portfolio of our, of our black operations. And up until that assignment, all of my experience was in the Middle East. I deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan. I'm a fluent Farsi speaker. That's my expertise. I get into this role, and I got all the briefings in the Situation Room about what all of our adversaries are doing. Right. And John, the stuff I learned about China, I mean, it, it keeps me up at night. But, but you don't even need to see the classified stuff to see that they're they're hungry and focused and they're eating our lunch i mean uh, they have a plan to suffocate us economically and they're moving out hard and fast to do that and here here in the united states it seems like we just we either have our heads in the sand or around each other's throats and i tell folks i say china's four times our size we have got to be a united states of america to make sure this is an american 21st century not a chinese one but they're focused and we're not, and we need leaders that can convey that message 
And, and one of the things I say a lot on the trail is ignite the patriot yeah. in everybody I come across as a leader. And you know, when, when our kids are being taught to hate the country and, and yeah. love socialism, we know we have a problem. But China's moving out hard and fast. We need leaders that understand that. And we need U.S. senators that understand that. We have a few, but, but that's what I'm gonna bring to the table. Awesome. Uh, can you drill down a little bit more into China is yep. eating our lunch? What is, yep. how are they eating our yes. lunch? And like, for instance, if they're, it's all the manufacturing, like my iPhone was all the parts are made in China is, is my answer. Well, don't buy the iPhone. How, what are the big places? Is it the iPhone stuff that China's eating our lunch on or is what's the bigger kind of picture? How, yeah. How, so, I mean, that, they view things obviously in a much longer term manner than we do. We view things a, and make decisions on election cycles. So they've got a plan to uh, supplant us by the middle of this century. And, and quite frankly, if we don't get our act together, it could happen sooner. And I give these three metrics every time economically. They just passed us this past year on the global Fortune 500 list of companies. They've got 124, we have 121. I think it's 76% of those are state owned, by the way. Wow. They just passed us as the country with the most foreign direct investment. That's always been That's us here in America. Way. Just passed us as Europe's largest trading partner. That's always been us here in America. And that's that matters because once you achieve the lion's share of a trade partnership with one of America's allies, you pretty soon. Terms. Exactly, yeah. and they're already doing that in Europe. And, and so I tell folks, you don't need to see the classified stuff. I mean, they're moving out hard and fast and it's happening right before our eyes. The one other thing I'll say too, just to, to underscore their level of focus, is I, I got asked a couple years ago, what keeps you up at night? I was still at the White House at the time. And I shared, look, I got the briefings, they, they do affect my sleep, but you know what keeps me up at most at night? Is that a couple months before I gave that interview, China had had a competition of their best and brightest youth and whittled it down to 28 boys and four girls to weaponize artificial intelligence against the United States. They picked their best 32. A few months before that, you know what happened? We had a walkout of Google, our best and brightest engineers, didn't want to support Project Maven, which of course is a DOD artificial intelligence contract. So just just to underscore the difference in mindset right now. So yeah, so China is against the U.S. and the U.S. is against the U.S. and well, it's kind of like how can we possibly sit of like a house divided against its stand, itself cannot stand. That's right. That's that right. was Jesus quoting Abraham Lincoln, or was it? Anyway, well, I think they both said it. Yeah. A house divided against itself cannot stand, and so, man, it is pretty bad when, uh, yeah, we're just so against ourselves, and China is against us as well. That's right. I mean, I mean, John, you, you nailed it. I mean, in my view, we have two existential threats facing our country. One is the ascent of communist China. Number two is ourselves, and we're just tearing each other apart in this country. And. You know, I share this sometimes and I think, gosh, it probably sounds really kumbaya coming from a military guy, but I tell folks, we've got to learn how to love each other in this country again. We've got to learn how to love this country again. That's good. Because you can't That's be good. a great country unless you're loved by your people. Right. And, uh, and so when I see Americans with that hate in, in, in their eye towards each other that you and I have seen overseas. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's a problem. And that's one of the reasons I stepped into this thing because I think you know, country first leaders that have had the experience that you've had and our brothers have had, and fortunately I've had, it gives you a different perspective. And yeah. I, think, I think you have the credibility to come in with a message of, you know, perspective over politics, so to speak. Like, That's hey, good. we're countrymen and women first. And China loves the divide. Yeah. They love what we're doing to ourselves. So, you know, we, that's gotta change quickly and we need leaders that, that, that'll lead that effort. That's and that's great. what I intend to do on this pathway. I was uh, talking to your campaign director before you uh, got here today, and I was just kind of talking about my just general disdain for politicians. And, and it's, it's kind of this, of everyone's saying the same platitudes. It's kind of like, you know what we need to do is we need to reunite around our values. And we need to, and, and, and there's never a defining of this. It's all just so nebulous and all just mm -hmm. such empty kind of platitudes. And then everyone makes a big deal on how articulate someone is or how intelligent they are. And I'm like, flush intelligent. I'm, I'm tired 
of intelligent. What I care about the most, I mean, I'm not advocating stupid. Sure. Uh, I'm just saying I care far more about values. I want to see actual passion, not platitudes, but passion. I want to know that you believe in something and you're going to see it through even if the masses you know, are against you. Now that, that makes a problem of how do you get elected if the masses are against you. But yeah. I, I guess I, what I want to do is I want to follow courage and virtue. What I don't want is brilliant uh, evil people. John, John, I mean, so we're only eight weeks into this campaign, but I can tell you from the feedback I'm getting on the trail, you're, you're not alone. I yeah. mean, people want an authentic leader. I mean, and so my wife, Melissa and I, God bless her, you know, she put up with the military stuff and I was gone all the time and now we just jumped into this arena. Uh, but at the end of the day, we've talked about, the only way we actually lose this thing is if we can't look ourselves in the mirror at the end of it. Uh, we have a thesis that if we are just ourselves, I mean, this has worked my entire career. I've been my own man and I lead the way I think is the right way to lead based on my values and, yeah. and things have a way of working out. Politics is a different animal, as you just noted. So time will tell, but eight weeks in, the feedback I'm getting on the trail, man, people are like, what I love about you is you're authentic. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what I was searching for. I, but as I was wrestling with this decision, I kept hoping for somebody else to come along, jump in this race yeah. that possessed what we need our leaders to possess. Right. And we've been around those folks in the military and we don't have our best and price. We have ex in office, we have a few exceptions, but I think the problem in our country is we don't have our best and brightest in office and the best leaders are running businesses, sports teams, other enterprises, and they're not getting in for the hundred reasons that Melissa and I have listed out why it made no sense for us. But man, that's got to change because our country, as we all know, is heading towards a cliff. Uh, agreed. Now, as national security guy, that's your expertise. That's your old hat and background. Uh, we talked about China being possibly the greatest threat toward the United yeah. States right now. Sorry, Joe, sleepy Joe, you were wrong. Uh, but China is, is possibly the worst. What would a good political leader be doing regarding China right now? Yeah, so one, I mean, in, in, the, in the 20th century, you had, you had senators that understood the world. They understood national security. They understood foreign policy, and they felt it was a responsibility to educate people on the, the, the threats that our country faced so that we could mobilize as, as a country, win World War I, win World War II, win the Cold War. You have some leaders doing that today, but we need more leaders educating the populace on the China threat. And thankfully it already is starting to, people are picking up wind of the fact that it's a real threat. As far as what I could do in a U.S. Senate seat, I mean, I, I've seen, uh, the underbelly of our institutions on the national security side of the house. It, of is it as bad as I can imagine? It's just, so there's, there's, yes, okay. it is. Uh, but there's good people up there working on behalf of the country, as we all know, in those institutions. But there's still big bureaucracies. And, we, and, and I got the full spectrum view of how they're operating. And, and quite frankly, we've got work to do. There's improvements that need to be made in the DOD and the IC side of the House. And you can only do it from the US Senate because you control the funding and the authorities. And so one of the things I'd like to do is I, I'd like for at the Department of Defense and all of our intelligence communities, I want 50% at a minimum of the budget and resources to be geared towards the China threat. Wow. And they can divvy up the rest of the world, the rest of the threats, however they want, but that's how serious I think the China threat is. Yeah. And so that's something that I will push for as a U.S. Senator if I'm elected next year. And what, what does that actually go into? Cybersecurity stuff, energy independence, uh, manufacturing, or... T I, I sure, yeah, I mean, look, on the DOD side, it's, it's, it's advanced weaponry that's, that's okay. better prepared for that threat. On the IC side of the house, it's, it's other stuff that, Similar to the DOD, but, but different, and that's kind of all I can say on that. Yes, energy independence, I mean, securing our, our electric grid, I mean, just a year or two ago. And this is unbelievable. We imported massive, I think it's like a 500,000 pound electric transformer from China. They decided to send it to one of our national labs, we did, when it came in uh, as a country. And they found hardware that was put into that that had the ability for somebody in China to switch it off. Awesome. I mean, you know, awesome. they, they, don't, they don't play by any rules. No, uh -uh. You know, and, and we're still trying to play a gentleman's game. Yeah. And, and that's just, as you know, these, these, the, these bullies uh, that, that operate overseas, they don't, they don't 
But they don't play by the rules. No, and you know, we didn't win our country in the first place by standing toe to toe with the Redcoats and fighting like gentlemen. We fought Indeed. like guerrilla warfare Indeed. savages. Indeed. We Francis yes. Marion. And we got the results <laughs> you know, and, we needed. And so, yes. yeah, that, that's a good point. Yes. That's a good point. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, what about the border? Right yeah, now, I, I noticed when Trump was in office, the left just are, is constantly castigating him about being just so immoral regarding the border. And then I see Kamala Harris saying, do not come. How uh, on the scheme of national security and the border with cartels and yep. stuff, uh, how much of that is a threat compared to something like that of China? Sure. It's a huge national security threat because, I mean, if we don't know who's coming across our border, I mean, you and I both know that it, it's it's not necessarily just folks from Latin American countries. And, no. and the whole world is seeing how porous our border is. And so it's a, it's a huge national security threat. You know, I find it funny that Kamala is saying, you know, don't, don't come now when, when our, our president, her president, Joe Biden, basically invited all these people day one of, of, of their administration to right. come to come to the border. Um, and, you know, it's just another example of uh, big government false promises. Right. Yeah. Come, come, to Amer- come to America. We're not going to send you back. You know, we don't care if you come over our border. And, you know, what really kind of gets me, John, on this issue, I and mean, you kind of got to it earlier with, with Trump, but Folks like to paint, on the other side, like to paint conservatives like you and me as heartless for wanting to secure the border yeah. and, and, that, and how that's inhumane. Yeah. Well, I think what we're seeing on the border right now is about as inhumane as it gets. Yeah. I mean, a false promise was made to all of these people that are trying to come here and kids are being trafficked by these coyotes to get across the, the border. There's a whole industry. I talked to folks in Texas. There's a whole industry of trafficking because of this. And so you want to talk about inhumane. I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we're not the heartless ones as conservatives. Wanting a secure border is best for all. It's best for the people on the other side of the border, and it's best for us here in America. Yep. And having a legitimate immigration system like we have that, that helped build our country into what it is, yeah. that's that's great. We have to have a secure border, though. I mean, I always say you cannot have an immigration policy unless you have a secure border, period. All right, so um, I haven't heard a single thing from Raphael Warnock regarding borders or stuff. It looks like he's just lefty ideology rubber stamp, but I kind of haven't heard anything. What would you be suggesting for border security kind sure. of stuff? Um, so, I mean, I was stationed out in Southern California for about six years before heading to the East Coast. and. Uh, you know, they've got these massive tunnels that they've built. You know, the coyotes have built them underneath. So, so a wall is part of the solution, and we've got to figure out. But they're tunneling right, under they're tunneling now. under. So we've got to get a little more creative. Now, I have been in briefings at the White House where Border Patrol folks talk about how the wall helps because it funnels it funnels folks into certain areas and therefore they can apply their resources to go and grab these folks. But, you know, the thing I think about with this issue, John, is that, you know, we're the most innovative country on the planet. Yeah. I mean, we can build a wall, maybe we build a wall yeah. down too, but there's areas of the southern border where it's almost impossible to build a wall. Yeah. But why not have a technological wall? And there's, there's companies out there that can integrate AI and these drones that are unbelievable yeah. to make sure that they're, they're, they're monitoring the entire area and then, and then that enables the Border Patrol agents to focus on certain areas. So bottom line is there's a way to secure it. I think we need a physical wall where we can that goes up and down uh, that can't be tunneled through. And then we need a technological wall in the areas that can't be walled. And then we need to bolster intel resources for our, for our Border Patrol. Senator Warnock, what, what, do, what do you think about that? See, not to say Jack. <laughs> he did it. He got, he got elected. That's what <laughs> right, he wanted. Right, he got elected. Right, right. He's going to make yeah. it, gonna make it yeah. kind-hearted. Right. But at uh, least he has to defend that seat next November. Uh, so, you know. All right. So we talked about China. We talked about our physical southern border. What are some other security threats? Uh, mainly what I'm thinking of is cyber. Yep. We've uh, seen a lot of that. And then hitting our energy grids of like, I'm thinking like the biggest stuff. Are th- those four kind of the biggest things? I would, I, I would rank them. Yeah, they would all be in tier one for sure. Okay. But China's top number one China is number like one. cyber security and then because the borders, yeah. The border I mean, they like, all go, yeah. I mean, look, they all go hand in hand. I put China at the top. It's all real but important. Yes, <laughs> yes very well, important. Talk to me about <laughs> energy and also cyber. Yeah, yeah. So on the energy front, I mean, we made such strides 
during the Trump administration towards energy independence. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, gas prices at an all-time low. Fracking enabled us to be very independent from the Middle East uh, and other parts of the world. And then you're seeing a lot of reversals uh, of that in the Biden administration, which is unfortunate. And of course, we're seeing gas prices go up, and uh, it's a mess. But uh, you know, one of the things that's more alarming that I shared with people is this whole issue of this, again, leading back to China, the transformer that, yeah. that, that came here a couple of years ago, and they found that China had installed hardware to effectively be able to shut this thing off yeah. from Beijing. Uh, so we're, we're, we're far more vulnerable on that front than we need to be. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it also goes back into where we are as Americans today. I mean, how, how resilient are we really at this point? I mean, I still believe that Americans are the hardest people on the planet. I believe we're the most compassionate and loving. I, but I love end, that you say that. I totally it, disagree. Yeah, well, I, I think mean, we're I'm so weak. I think we're the weakest generation that's ever walked the planet now. Look, I just made a video. I just made a video, and I want you to be right. I want to be wrong. I want you to be right. I mean, that's what but I. But it looks like what, yeah. with intersectionality, yeah. we compete to be the weakest we, we do. compete to be victims but that's not courage isn't yes. celebrated anymore we're coddled to such an extent of like you know of like we have safe spaces we're like it doesn't look like the blood of our forefathers runs through our veins anymore and i want to be wrong i want to believe that so we've got John, american that, grit. yeah <laughs> that look all of those things you just mentioned are things that really just break my heart, frankly, as an American, to see just the softening of the underbelly. But I still believe uh, at its core, and, and maybe it's just from the time of the military, I mean, that I will bet on America still all day, every day, but we have to, we have to get back on the right track to where yeah. we love this country again, where we understand the, the value of liberty yeah. I mean, because you've seen it overseas. I mean, people, we're like a, I agree, we're like a third generation of a wealthy estate that's just, you know, pissing away our inheritance here as Americans. So I agree yeah. with you, but I, but I don't think it's lost because I guess where I'm different is I feel like if we've lost that, then we've lost our country. And I'm still, I still have this glimmer of hope. And, no, I, I and, and I don't want to jump on yeah. it anymore because yeah. I, I mean, I, we got I, I up, need man. the, and, and yeah. so what I can't do is I can't speak for where the whole country is. Yeah. And I, I'm, I, Hmm. You look at all the woke UCLA oh, it's, students, it's, just, it's, it's, it's all maddening. so bad, but I know we're a million poets strong right mm -hmm. here that exactly. that they, they, exactly. they've they still got heart. They've got that uh, that uh, s that American spirit, not just Americans, but we got, I know we're global, but all you poets out there where uh, your forces for good in the world, you live for higher purpose, and we go shoulder to shoulder any day of the week. And so Perfect all example. hope is not lost. Yeah. Yeah. One thing on, on what you just hit, though, is just like it's trendy, unfortunately, to be weak and woke, yeah. uh, what you guys are doing here is important because yeah. I think you do represent higher values and a higher calling and a higher service. And I think the battle, the ultimate battle, is winning over more followers that turn into leaders through, through a movement like this. Because if it's that easy for people to become weak and woke, yeah. they, it, it, we, we can do the same on the being yeah. compassionate yeah. and hard Americans front. That's right. I really believe that. And we have, we have a remnant yeah. here. And I know that cowardice spreads yeah. like a contagion, but so does courage. That's right. And That's right. so, Amen. Um, and I think people, uh, a lot of folks are angry, they're displaced, they're passionate, they're loving protectors. Yeah. And uh, if, if they had some hope, if they had a direction that we, you know, people could rise up and that's a good thing. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but yeah, hey, I think it's time for your a Middle Eastern story. So <laughs> tell, tell everyone <laughs> the dumbest thing you've ever done. <laughs> That's really cool. It's, it's not like it stands out for sure. <laughs> uh, but luckily, we were smart about it. Okay. Uh, you know, but the uh, in my twenties, I uh, I was learning Farsi. Mm -hmm. uh, I was living in Tajikistan. They speak a dialect of the Persian language in Tajikistan, 
Uh, so it's Farsi in Iran, Dari in Afghanistan, and Tajik in T Tajikistan. And so I was in Tajikistan studying the language. I lived there for 10 months with a local Muslim family. I'm a Christian, and so it was just a really surreal experience, man. I mean, we ate on the floor every night. Uh, I had food poisoning most of the time. I weighed about a buck fifty. Um, and before coming home, I wanted to see the rest of the region. So I backpacked through all the other stands except for Pakistan to include northern Afghanistan. So uh, hired a driver to the border. So uh, civilian? Civilian. White dude. Yes. Just packs across Afghanistan. Yeah, Bebopping around Afghanistan. Without uh, guns. Without guns. Without guns. <laughs> without guns. <laughs> yes. Without guns. It was great. I mean, hitchhiked through the region. I mean, people asked, what was the most danger you felt there? And we, we, we didn't stay in one place very long, so we were as smart as you could be within the circle of doing something really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the threat, the, the, the biggest sort of threat to my life I felt uh, was, you know, those Toyota Corollas that everybody drives over there. Yeah, they're like, the, yeah, they're like uh, freaking um, white and yellow. Yeah. Well, they're just they're just idiot drivers. I mean, they drive like 80 miles an hour around mountains passing people. Yeah. And I thought, I'm going to die in a car accident backpacking yeah. through Afghanistan, not from, you know, other things happening. Uh, but hey, it was, we were there uh, about six days and it was, it was pretty awesome, man. It was awesome. Uh, did you die? Didn't die. You didn't this die. This is the real me. You didn't man. die in didn't case die. was holding their breath. Didn't die. He made it back. And then it was neat to go and deploy there later on. Yeah, you know? and you brought guns yeah. and... I brought guns and buddies and that buddies, time. Guns and buddies it's a way a better deal. Plan to yes. If you must hike through yeah. Afghanistan, I have many times, I recommend guns and buddies. <laughs> Always. You know? it, Always. It, it, it was neat amidst, uh, you know, the terrorists that suck and are horrible uh, humans that need help being extricated from the planet. Over in Afghanistan and Iraq, I don't know about you, but I met a lot of just good oh, yeah. Muslim people and you play with their kids kids and yeah. you trade food and you sit down with yeah. meals and give gifts and hang out. We had cool. interpreters and we had locals and we kind of made as best we could some friendships sure. there too. And, yeah. it, and it turns out that if you're not trying to murder people in cold blood, you can actually be friends with just about anyone regardless of your ideology. So that was pretty cool. It, it is cool. And I, I'm sure you experienced this as well. I mean, just the value of wearing that American flag patch yeah. and just people, you know, they recognize it and, and they're like, you're an American, thank you. you yeah. know? I mean, that that does happen over there, as yeah. you know, which and is cool. So Afghanis treated us like rock stars yeah. they loved. They're helping free us from oppression or that we're devils that yeah. need to be killed. It's one of the two. Between. No no <laughs> one was undecided about America. It's like, mm, yeah. I don't know. Right, right. One extreme or the other, for That's sure. That's awesome. For sure. Well, hey, man, thanks so much yeah. for hanging out with us. Thank you. Uh, where can everyone find you? If, if You'll find them on a ballot in the state of Georgia. Latham Sadler, <laughs> vote for him. Uh, but where can we find you technology-wise? Yes, I know big, te big Tech's kind of yeah, they haven't, not helping you. They, they, they disabled me on Twitter day one of the campaign, but we're back up and running. At least our website has been uh, up and running since day one, and it's LathamSadler.com, so L-A-T-H-A-N. M S A D D L E R dot C O M and come join the mission. I mean, we've got folks from all crosses of, of life, generations, backgrounds excited about this mission to take back the U.S. Senate next year. And Georgia's the top seat. It's the top priority seat next year in the country for the Republican Party to win back. And so uh, we're going to be ready to rock and win this thing back and put a check to what's going on in Washington. That's our best chance to do it. So Sounds thank awesome. you for thank you for having me on. Let me share my story. It's yeah, been, for sure. And, and the shoot was fun, man. Shoot was fun. All right, shoot man. was fun. All right, Appreciate man. you, man. Links down below. Train hard, train smart. And for the love of God, stay free. See you guys.